Jonathan Barry from Exceltis. Thank you for joining our webinar on Oracle EPM Load Generation. We'll get started now. So this webinar is uh, probably the second or third in our informational series. Uh, the first one we covered HFM rules profiling. Here we're going to discuss load generation for Oracle EPM. And then coming soon we'll have some more things on like remote uh, monitoring, remote user locations, as well as other key functionality within the Oracle EPM suite. But what we're going to talk about today is load generation and how it can be used in the Oracle EPM environment and the different ways it can be used and the value that we can get out of it. So the structure for the webinar, I believe everyone is on mute. If you do have questions, you can enter them into the chat box. If we can get to them during the presentation, we will. Uh, if there's something relevant for the moment, Ed Delisi, who's also on, will jump in and ask it verbally. Otherwise, we'll be sure to get back to you with answers after the webinar. Okay. So we'll go through a couple of slides, and then we'll actually show some product demonstration about how the Exceltis tool solves the problem. But first and foremost, I just want to point out that the Exceltis uh, solution is a, is a packaged enterprise software solution. It is not a consulting solution. So we always like to just give people a background on who we are and what we provide. So understand that as a company, we provide a packaged software solution. A little bit of background on us is that I founded the company in 2008 after spending many years at Hyperion leading the uh, Hyperion HFM and FDM teams. Also on our team are former Hyperion technologists and developers, and we also have Ed Delisi who just joined us from uh, Finit and former, formerly an executive at Upstream. So our team is all Hyperion technologists and folks who are uniquely uh, suited to be, to be talking to you today about this uh, Oracle EPM solution. First, let's take a step back and really understand uh, we like to have our prospects and customers really do a self-assessment on where they stand regarding their proficiency of Oracle EPM. And this really helps people determine what type of processes and solutions they need in place. You really have to have a good idea of, of where you are with regard to how you leverage the Oracle EPM suite. So this is something we call the Application Performance Management Proficiency Model. And Really, when you first get involved with Oracle EPM, you start out at the lowest levels where you really don't have monitoring place, and all of your diagno diagnosing and troubleshooting is all reactionary and ad hoc. And then as you evolve and you get more proficient, you incorporate more monitoring, you incorporate more monitoring with alerts. There may be some automation in place. You get a better feel for what users are doing in the system. And then ultimately, you can get very proficient and evolved in your leveraging in your leverage of the system, and you may have predictive alerting, capacity planning, benchmarking, and baselining. And the promise of the Excel to solution is that we can enable clients to achieve that highest level of the proficiency model in a very short amount of time. <clears throat> so the other point we want to make is the Excel to Ascension Suite covers all the various aspects of Oracle EPM and performance management. What we're talking about today is just one aspect of it. It's in simulations. So we will talk about uh, load generation. We'll also talk about some of the other areas that are kind of a subset of load generation, including things like incremental user simulations, running simulations as part of the health check, as well as replaying historical activity. And again, this is one part of what Exceltis offers, so just kind of put it into context. <clears throat> and understand that when we talk about low generation, low generation can provide great value if it's done correctly. And we look at the value of low generation to try to break it down into different elements to show uh, what it can do for us over the course of our deployment. So we just position it as something that is not something that is done all at once, but it can be, but it can be broken down and provide value along the way. So again, Doing user simulations and load generation is, can provide great value at many aspects of our deployment. So the question is, why isn't everyone doing it? Why aren't all clients leveraging user simulations as part of their daily process? 
And the reason is this. The tool of choice for Oracle EPM right now is LoadRunner, and LoadRunner comes with many challenges. So we're going to take a few moments and we're going to kind of cover kind of what the benchmark is with LoadRunner and how Exceltis compares to it. And then we'll actually get into uh, what it means to design load tests and perform them. But having this as a baseline will help us put everything else into context. So right now with LoadRunner, as many clients have already done it, it requires a lot of training and specific skills. So to address this, what Exceltis does is we provide Hyperion load tests right out of the box. So with our load tool, which we'll show is on day one, you already have those tests pre-scripted. So you just have to tweak it with uh, your own things like your credentials and your uh, report names and these sorts of things, and you could be off and running very quickly, and we'll show this. So we address that issue of only, um, you know, with LoadRunner, you have to have those very specific people who have those skills to even get started. The next, the next issue with load testing in general, and this isn't so much a load runner issue as load testing in general, is that to design test, you're taking your best guess as to what users are doing. So a lot of people sit around a table and say, okay, for this load test, we want to have 50 consolidators and 100 people running SBase calcs and 200 people running reports. And if those tests aren't an accurate, an accurate depiction of what users are doing, then the results are generally uh, worthless because the tests aren't a true depiction, so your results aren't terribly useful. So what Exceltis does is we can generate tests based on actual historic activity. So we leverage activity logs as well as our own user activity tracking to replay history. So we'll show how we do this as well. But ultimately, it takes that whole guesswork right out of the equation. The next issue with LoadRunner, and this is more of a <clears throat> more of a result of some of the other problems, is that people think about load testing as the Big Bang Theory. It's something that gets done once with a new environment and then it's forgotten. So that might give us some early indications about how our system may perform if the tests are designed right, but then it does nothing for us going forward. However, if load tests were designed so that they could be run on a schedule, and run incrementally throughout our deployment, maybe on a weekly or daily basis, then we can get some great regular feedback about how our system is performing. So with Exceltis, we make it very easy to not only define those load profiles, but to run them ad hoc or to schedule them so that we always have a very recent uh, performance data on how our system is performing under, under load. The other problem with something like LoadRunner is it doesn't help detect new issues. So if something happened, if everything was fine yesterday, but we have a problem today at 2 o'clock, having those tests that are sitting uh, on a server somewhere don't do us much good. But if we can incorporate regular user simulations on a regular basis every day, maybe every hour, then it can act as an early warning system. And we will show how Exceltis helps us achieve that. And the other thing is, and we'll put it right out there, um, you know, people will say, well, LoadRunner is a very sophisticated system and it does a lot of things. And we say, yes, it is. It does many, many things, but Exceltis does the things that you need for Hyperion. It's kind of like Excel. 90% of the people use 10% of the functionality. What we have done is built in the core functionality that you need for Hyperion and made it very easy to use. And then lastly, uh, LoadRunner can be very cost prohibitive. It's very expensive. Um, with Exceltis, you can own the solution for about the same cost of a few months lease of LoadRunner. And this is something afterwards you can talk to uh, Ed DeLisi uh, for details. And ultimately, what this means is the easier it is to do, the more likely you are to do it. So by breaking down the barriers for getting the test running and being able to do it on a regular basis, we make it so that it can be incorporated and you can get that regular value out of uh, running load generation. Okay. So a quick agenda. We'll talk about the fundamentals of load testing. We'll talk about the various types of tests that we can run. We'll talk about designing tests, how to execute them. And if we have time, we'll talk about analysis. Analysis is, is really about once we get results, what can we do uh, with it? And depending on how much time we have, we may or may not get to that, but we can certainly cover that you know, in another session. So fundamentals. You know, before we do anything, you really need to, to decide 
what you want to get out of load testing. And this comes back to the Big Bang Theory where I think a lot of prospects and, and uh, Oracle EPM customers will do load testing because it's a checkbox, because they say, ah, we have a new environment, we need to run load testing. They don't really know what they want to get out of it, they just need to be able to say that they did it. Well, there's a lot of reasons why you may want to run load testing, and some of them are uh, to really determine what our hardware needs are. So we know that we have a certain number of users, we know that we're using this type of hardware, how many boxes do we need to provide a certain quality of service to our end, to our end uh, users? Another w reason we might want to do load testing is to determine what the breaking point is for our existing environment. So our hardware is fixed, we need to know how many users we can, we can support performing various activities before we run into uh, inad inadequate performance. Another reason for running load testing might not be to break the system, but really just to understand what we can expect. So we might have some flexibility on whether you know our reports run in three seconds or 30 seconds, but we just need to know what's normal and what our users can expect. And we might want to do it between environments. We might have a 9.3 environment and we're upgrading to 11.1.2, and we might want to know what is our base expectation in one environment versus another environment. And then otherwise, we may want to track performance over time, and this is where we get into that incremental testing. So, so first, after determining <clears throat> what we really want to get out of it, we then need to decide what type of tests are needed. And, and this is really what tricks a lot of people up, because they just assume that load testing is, is heavy concurrency testing. But there's really a lot of different types of tests, and each one can tell us a different piece of information. So we start out with what's called single or multiple multi-user performance testing. So uh, a single user test is very good for getting kind of a baseline of different types of activities when the rest of the system is not getting exercised. And then we start layering different, different groups of users to understand what we can expect as we ramp up the user. And that's really talking about concurrency. So what can, we be, what can be expected for end user response time, as well as system strain when we have a lot of concurrency on the system. The next one is longevity uptime. So it might be that we can run a test where we very quickly ramp up to 1,000 users or 2,000 users, and we say, hey, we hit 2,000 users, great, we're good, Let, we're done. But truthfully, once you, once you plateau with the number of users that you want to run, another test is longevity, meaning how long can our system stay stable at that concurrency? Because it might be that there are issues lurking with timing issues, or there might be memory leaks, or some other type of issue that are only going to expose themselves after a couple of hours, or maybe even after a couple of days. So if you have the luxury of running a test for many days or weeks, that's something that might yield uh, issues that you don't find if you just ramp it up quickly. And for you know, customers who want to do not have a plan to reboot every week, where they expect their systems to be up for a couple weeks, running longevity tests over a couple, you know, over a week may be something that's critical to do. The next one is stress testing. This is kind of a variation of concurrent testing, concurrency testing, where we not only want to see that we can support a certain number of users, but we actually want to see how the system reacts when we stress it to the point of, of failures. Meaning that as we increase the number of users, we might start seeing failures, but the system might be able to recover. So uh, we might see that the reports might fail, but as it starts flushing its queue of requests, it gets back to a stable state. So is that the case, or can we determine that once we start seeing failures, the system is beyond repair, and that's really important so that we can put alerts in place to detect that, hey, if we detect this pattern of activity, let's send an alert or let's automatically restart the server because we know that once we hit this point, there's really no recovery. And then incremental user simulations, and we'll talk about this, where this is something about putting in place a, a synthetic transaction, maybe from different locations where we can detect performance of a specific activity, and we can use that for not only detecting performance over time, but as that early warning system where if performance quickly takes a downturn, we can send an alert and get someone on it before our user community experiences the problem. Okay. So once we determine what types of tests we want to run, we really have to look at what our 
the mix of users and tests that we want to use are. So it's not good enough to know that we want 500 users. It's really 500 users running what tests. So how many users in total? You know, so people will say, well, we have 2,000 users, you know, um, 2,000 named users, but at any one time, do we expect half of that, a quarter of that? Are these users ge geographically dispersed so that there is never more than 300 users on at one time? Or are they all in one location and during our year end close, we expect all of them to be on in the system? So having a feel for what we expect the total named users as well as the total concurrency at any one time is important. It's also important to know what the, the breakdown is. What, what is the mix of users running reports versus consolidations uh, versus analytic users going to be? Do we even know that information? Also important to know the mix of what we call kind of readers versus writers, which is really a technical term for the product mix, but understand that we may be able to support 100 users running reports on any server, but maybe only three or four running big consolidations. So all users are not created equal, and understanding kind of the different uh, roles that users have is important to breaking down not only the, uh, the, the total concurrency, but also the mix of what users are doing. And then kind of this is, this is funny, this is really the big one. What constitutes a user? So what is the expected level of activity of any user? Where one, one person might say that a user is going to run reports and they'll refresh the report once every 15 seconds. Someone else might say, you know what, a really active user refreshes a report once every three minutes. So having consensus on what a user is is going to be important because otherwise you could have reports that, uh, results that say that you can support 500 users where in fact depending on what the nature of what a user is, maybe you could really only support 200 at the same level of activity, or maybe you could support 1,000. So kind of understanding what the level of activity of a user is, is going to be relevant. And then lastly, of course, we covered this a little bit, what is the mixture of our various, various tasks? Who is doing what? Um, are they all web users? Are they running things on the back end? So really getting that, that breakdown is, is key. Now again, we're going to show you part of what Exceltis offers is by replaying historic activity, all of this becomes an on issue because we don't have to guess at what, pe what users are doing. We will actually look at what users have done and use that as a feed to the low tool. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Okay. So these are some of the test modes. And what we're going to do is after this slide, we're actually going to demonstrate how some of this can be done, and then we'll come back to some of the details about analysis uh, if we have time at the end. But <clears throat> what many people think is that the only way to, to run load testing is via this defined profile, that you define a profile and you run this big test that takes seven hours and then we're done. Uh, but we contend that there's actually multiple modes to run load testing. The first is ad hoc, to have a tool where we can just start running load, we can dynamically change the mix of tests we're running. We can increment uh, or increase the, the level of users and start to see results. And we can see in real time how changing these kind of variables affects the results that we're getting. We can also define load profiles. So this is what most people typically think of, which is defining stages for a test, ramping users up. Uh, breaking up the mix of tests, and we'll show how you can do this in our tool as well. The third one, and this is something that, that we're introducing, is the ability to just replay historical user activity. So let's not spend really any time defining a, a, a low profile. Let's just take what our users did during our last close, and let's replay that. And we can replay it on our current environment. We can replay it uh, on a new version. So we can take our 11.113 close and we can replay it on our 11 to 1 environment and we can play it one for one meaning play it in real time so our close took five days <clears throat> we could replay that close over the course of five days or we could amplify we could say listen we know our system is great during this close with this number of users but we're going to be adding a bunch more users let's just amplify the current activity by 50 percent and let's see what happens 
or we can shorten and lengthen the time. Our close really took five days. Let's replay it over one day, which is effectively amplifying it, and let's see what uh, let's see how our system reacts. And then the last mode of testing is really about integrating these user simulations on a more regular frequency, whether it's every 10 minutes or every hour, so that we have this this uh, results from different locations or right on the system of how a what our quality of service is to our end users. So with that, I'm actually going to jump over to actually show you these various these various test modes. And Ed, hopefully you're on. If there's any, if we're having any issues or there's any questions, please jump in and and let me know because again I won't be able to see the <clears throat> I won't be able to see the questions as they're being asked. Okay. So what we're looking at right now is we're looking at the Exceltis Ascension Suite main UI dashboard. And we'll be coming back to this to actually watch how our user simulations are represented in the system. But I'm going to bring up a tool. Right now this is our load testing tool. Let me clear out our, our load tests. Let's clear all. Okay. So what we're going to do is out of the box, we provide various what we call load packages. So here I have a couple loaded. I have FDM, HFM Smart View, Core HFM, anything you do in a grid. I have some planning tests and I have a financial reports test. And just to get started, I'm very quickly going to come in and I'm going to say I'm going to run 100% of my test is going to be financial reports. And this package is basically it opens up a report and does a refresh. And <clears throat> there's no scripting on the part of the customer with our solution. All you would need to do is come in and change your client specific information, things like your usernames, your passwords, and your report names. So I have two reports loaded and what we're going to do is we're going to run these and then we're going to add one. So I have a report called employee status and I have another one which I think is GL income statement. So I'm just going to start running this test. So if, if you have the solution, you come in, you'd enter your usernames, your report names, and you basically hit the go button and we're started out with four users. So I'm just going to ramp this up to, to 10 users. And in our case, we've defined a user as doing one action a minute. So very so I can change my definition of a user. So a user is going to perform on average one action every 60 seconds. So at 10 users, once every six seconds we're going to kick off a report on average. And we can see that we're running the reports and it is doing a true user simulation. As far as Hyperion concerned, there is someone out there in the web running uh, running reports and there we've defined that they would run the employee status report or the GL income statement report. And just to show what this looks like within the system, and this is not supposed to be a demo or uh, instruction on the Excel to system, but I am quickly going to show you the activity analysis where we can actually see that activity happening in real time in the UI. So I'm just going to pick our user activity query. We're going to grab for the last 30 minutes. And I can come and drill in on user activity. So I quickly zoomed in. And we can see all of these things are users performing activities. And I'm going to come to financial reports, which is this row right here. And as I scroll over these particular user activities, I can see that I have users running the employee status report and the GL income statement report. So I can quick zoom in on, on what they're doing. And I can see, great, so I see that my load generation, as far as Hyperion is concerned, someone's out there running these reports and I can see how long it's taking each user uh, and so on and we can run all types of reports but here we're just looking at it in real time. So this is great. So now what I want to do is very quickly I want to again without having to re-record any scripts and what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this on so it'll auto clear them as they pass. I want to add another report to our mix. So all I need to do is come in here and say we're going to add an iteration and in addition to running my employee status report and my GL income statement, I'm going to run balance sheet. So now, as it's running through this test, it'll run one of those three reports. 
And it's very easy to go in and add. If we want to add 100 reports or 1,000 reports, it's very easy to add those reports. And uh, on the back end, we'll actually be able to pick them right out of the BI Plus repository. And now that we're running these, this is great. Now when I come back in here, I would see that balance sheet report as well. Okay, this is great. But now what I want to do is I actually want to crank up the number of users. So great, I want to add more load. So all I need to do, and then again, this is our ad hoc tool. Once we're done with this, we're going to show how this can be done by defining a profile. But just ad hoc, I'm going to crank this up to 100 users. And what that means is once, even more than once a second, it's going to come in and it's going to start clicking off these reports. Okay, so now there's a lot of activity being generated. And just because I'm running this on one server, I'm going to change this back down again to like 50 users, which is still a lot of activity. And you can see them getting queued up right away. Let me bring this back down to 10 and let these get flushed. But what you'll see is these will all get flushed, and when we go back into the activity analysis, we'll see that the tests that we're running in two or three seconds, all of these are probably taking like 10 or 15 seconds. So right away, without having to think too much or define tests or to schedule anything, I know right away that with 100 users on the system, the performance that was three or four seconds with maybe 10 users turned into like 20 or 30 seconds if I had 100 users. And now what I want to do is I'm just uh, dynamically, very quickly, I'm going to say I want to add some other things going on in the system. So I want to run 30% HFM Smart View forms and 30% HFM Smart View formulas. So now what we'll see is we're no longer just running financial reports. We'll start seeing HFM Smart View come into play. So I'm going to let a couple of these run, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over and actually show that activity in the system, which we'll crank this up a little bit more to get more test running. And now if I jump back over, okay, so there's some smart view forms running. So now when I come back over to see what's going on in my system, again, we're just going to graph this for the last 30 minutes, and I'll zoom in. So now what we see, and actually right away, I can see that what you was taking uh, looks like six seconds. When I cranked up the activity, now things started taking about 30 seconds. So the activity really started as we added more users, it took a lot longer to run that activity. And now not only am I running reports, but I'm running HFM Smart View forms and formulas, and I can see all that data coming into the system. So very quickly, we were able to, right out of the box, open up our tool, set up our form name, set up our user credentials, which actually the usernames I created ahead of time. But very quickly, we can do this, uh, we can do this uh, graphically. And just as one more example, and then I'll move on, I'm actually going to show you what a failure looks like. So let's clear out these tests. And I'm going to run, let's do 100% HFM Smart View Forms. And here I, have t I, I basically have it set up for two different users. But what I want to do, is I'm actually going to change one of these users to a username that doesn't exist, which is something interesting, and I would encourage people to think about this, because in a real world, users are going to sometimes enter in their credentials improperly, and the question is, does a failure to log in cause any funny side effects in the system? So by entering in a, an invalid user credential, what we're going to see is it's randomly picking one of these two user credentials as it runs. We're going to start seeing some failures come into the system. Let me just crank this. Let me just at least see one failure just so you can see that. Okay, there we go. So 50% of the time, we're going to start getting failures saying, hey, we can't, it cannot authenticate the system or the, uh, the user. So some will pass, some will fail, and it's all fine and good. We'll actually see those results. So with the load tool, we can simulate not only all types of activity, we can actually inject some intentional failures in there, uh, you know, just to see what happens in the system. So again, so this is now running in the background. Okay. And we'll actually stop, we'll stop this so we can talk about the other types of, of load testing. Real, real I'll just do one more. It. Jonathan? Yes. Hey, Jonathan, this is Ed. Real quick, if you, if you could just go back there. I just want to point out to everybody, <clears throat> you know, back to that slide uh, Jonathan showed earlier comparing this to Load Runner. 
what he's doing here <coughs> is, um, is is something that would have uh, otherwise taken a lot of time and a lot of expertise uh, from specialists and consultants who would actually have to write these scripts. And many of you who have been through that exercise before understand this. So a lot of times when we're talking to prospective clients and they talk about doing a load runner exercise, this is something they talk about, well, in two weeks we're going to do this. And we have everybody lined up and we have all the resources and everything is, is all getting ready to be done you know, in this time that we have scheduled ahead of time. Or what you see Jonathan doing, clicking through the software there, is actually doing this on the fly without actually having that specific expertise. You just have to understand how the software works and which kind of specific items you want to pick from. So I just want to kind of tie those two things together and make sure it's really clear um, how much simpler that is for uh, you know to do that here than it would be in Loadrunner. Yeah, Th thanks, Ed. And you know we are showing our product, but if nothing else, I think what we really want to convey is the value of incorporating user simulations as part of a regular basis. And ultimately, again, if it's easy enough to do every day, people will do it every day. It's because it's such a challenge that it only gets, gets done once and forgotten. But the value that we get out of it is tremendous. Where right here we're doing an ad hoc test, which anyone could jump on and do. But what we'll show now is how we can define a profile or replay history. And then it's something where if it's getting done in the background and it's automated, we'll get all these great concurrency results where we could see over the course of course of time, whether it's looking back on the last 30 days or the last 90 days, we'll be able to see that, hey, you know what, the average response time for planning uh, at, at a 50 level, 50 user concurrency jumped, you know, the middle of last month. Why is that? And, and it gives you a chance to jump in there and maybe start looking backwards and seeing what else happened in the system at that time. Where otherwise, you're waiting for your users to speculate that, hey, during our close, we seem to have a problem. Um, well, you can catch it before you get to your close. So we just showed the ad hoc tool. And I jumped into this module in the system just to show how the system is tracking it and to demonstrate how we can uh, how generating load goes from, you know, activities are very quick with a couple users, and then once you jump to a lot of users, look how slow things get. But now what I'll do is I'm going to jump over to our simulations module. <clears throat> so the next thing we want to look at is how can we define that load, that profile that we can then schedule. And without going really into a lot of, a lot of detail, what we see here is a graphical view of a load profile. And, and a load profile could be something where we define that big test that's going to run for, you know, four days, where we have many stages and we're going to ramp up our users and then we let it run for some amount of time. Or it could be something that's a little bit scaled down that we want to schedule to run every night to maybe just go up to 100 users just to get some performance data. But defining a profile is as easy as creating it, defining stages, and for each stage, we could say that we want the stage to start out with one user and we want it to ramp up to, okay, in this case we'll let it ramp up to 50 users. And then the next stage, it's going to take it and it'll ramp up to even higher and maybe the duration, we increase the uh, duration. So this, this is a very simple one that goes very quick over the course of a couple minutes. But this could just as easily be the hour. So we can graphically define a load profile, which is a test. A test is made up of multiple stages. Each stage can define how long the stage lasts, how many users it starts with, how many it ends with, <clears throat> what tests we're going to run. So in this case, we can run planning rules. We can run reports. We can run HFM Smart View. So basically, any of the packages, we can just define what tests we want incorporated in those stages. And we can also define what sites we want to participate. So if we have different load sites available, we can define that they all run all the tests, or we might decide that some are more relevant for other tests. But once this is saved, so we can save this profile very easily, we can then go and we can either run this ad hoc or as part of automation where again, this isn't a full Exceltis product demo, but this is our automation module where we can define automation across servers and across products. I could define a, a flow, and this will be 
daily simulation, <clears throat> and I want my, let's just define this, I want this to run every day at, uh, at midnight, so, or, or at 4 a.m. So when no one's on the system, we're going to run this flow. And what I want to do is we want to run that, that automation profile that we just created. So we can come in here and say run load profile, and we will pick that daily simulation that we just defined. Now we save this. Now every day at 4 a.m., that profile, which I think was, you know, the total time was probably about 30 minutes, uh, you know, simulating up to about 36 users will run. So again, by making it very easy to define a load test and scheduling it, not only will will it run every day, but now we will have performance data that we can go graph and we can go back uh, if we ran this daily. We could go back over the course of the last week or the last month and not only graph how certain activities performed, but we could graph by concurrency. So we could say, uh, you know, what's our response time for reports for a single user versus what's our response time uh, for 100 users? And very quickly determine whether our system is performing at the expectation that it was when we first designed it. So again, that early warning system at, at high concurrencies. What we can also do is say, well, know what, this is all fine and good, and here I'm showing you how we can define a test and the number of users, but, you know, what was all that stuff about replaying history? Why do I even have to define a test? Well, <clears throat> you don't. Instead of coming in here and trying to figure out, well, this stage should have this many users and this type of functionality, we can define a test that maybe has one stage or say this particular stage is going to be based on previous user activity. So we can come in and just for fun, remember we were looking at all of, all of this. We could say, if we just look at this over the last 12 hours, we'll see a lot of activity here. <clears throat> um, and in different bursts, because I was kind of running different simulations and, and so on, what we can do is we can actually come in and say, well, that activity that happened, maybe it was during our close or during some high level, it's all kind of grouped here. Okay. So here's a lot of activity, and this was all synthetic activity. This could have been real user activity. We could come into our simulations and say, listen, for this stage, I don't want to define what it is. I just want to come in and I want to say, whatever happened on this day between 8 a.m. and 11 a.m., that's what we want this stage to represent. So we can just go pick any point in time, whether it was four months ago for a four-day period. We basically define assign a stage to replay history from a specific point in time. Okay. And okay, then so when, you, when you replay that, can you make it clear that you can replay that um, in, in a test environment? You can replay that in whichever environment you, you decide? Yes, so right. So activity can be can be mapped. So even though the activity might have happened in our 9.3 environment, we're now on 11.1.2 environment that we can go back and, you know, filter and kind of map activity to to replace. So very simply, we have these packages like a, uh, a planning rule, for example, or financial report that we can map um, activity from any environment to a new environment. So it doesn't have to be replaying it on the environment on which it occurred. We can actually, it's portable, so we can push it to a new environment and play it there as well. Okay. So Again, we, we quickly looked at the ad hoc tool. We looked at how to define a profile, how to schedule it. Uh, we also looked at basically how to pick, although it wouldn't look like much, how to pick uh, replaying historical activity. The other thing I want to show is incorporating user simulations on a regular basis. We can then, we can then actually have that run in the background and get a lot of value out of that. So quickly, in my dashboard, right at the bottom I had a graph. And what this graph represents is running a user simulation from two different locations. And what I can see here is the blue line is running, it's the very same report we're running, the GL income statement report from one location. And the red line is running that same report from another location. And we have all these data points. So over the last like 12 hours, we can see 
that from this blue location, the average time to run that report was about a, almost 12 seconds. The average time to run that same exact report from this other location was three and a half seconds. And we can see this in a number of places. If I go over to the performance lab, and again, this is a demonstration of the product, but just to show that report in more detail. We can see here that if we had maybe a dozen or 30 different locations, we could define a user simulation, which is running that same exact, whether it's a, a planning rule or planning calc or financial report, and we could see what our users are experiencing. So we can set expectations that, listen, if you are at the location represented by the blue line, you can expect that your report on average is going to run in about 12 seconds. Whereas if you're lucky enough to be at this, wherever this red location is, you can expect that same report to come back in three and a half seconds. So again, it's all about having this capability. We can really get um, quanti quantifiable expectations about our user experience. What we can also do with this is we can, by having this running in the background, we can now set alert triggers. And we can say that if this report takes longer than, uh, you know, twice as long as the average, so if this takes more than 20 seconds, I want to get alerted because that means that there's a problem and the problem might be on the network or the problem might be in the environment. But we know that on average it takes 12 seconds here, so if we're hitting 20 seconds, something is going wrong. So we can set alerts so that we can proactively detect if there is a problem at one of our remote locations. We also have the idea for what the expectation is in our best case environment that we can now set service level agreements. So we can set SLAs. And here over in the dashboard I have some SLAs set for reports and for smart view forms that we can establish a service level agreement that says, hey, all of our reports from any location should always be better than, than 15 seconds. And what the SLA does is it's tracking how long all these activities are taking so that we have a measure of what the percentage of user transactions are coming within our service level agreement. So that we know right away as a manager or a stakeholder in this environment I have the ability to quickly look at this and say, wow, okay, all my HFM Smart V forms, they're all coming in, 100% of them are coming in within the agreement that we've established for our users. That's great. But holy cow, only 64% of our reports are running within that time frame that we measured. And then we have all these ad hoc tools that we can go back and determine, okay, why are we not hitting our, our, our measure? Uh, what's going on in the environment? Why is it slower than it was last week? And we can also then trend over time that we can establish our SLAs to say, okay, listen, we may only be hitting 64% today, but by June we want to hit 90%. So let's set these goals and let's track over time what our SLAs are measuring. And I believe a question came in <clears throat> regarding can we analyze the network latency for a distant machine, for example, from uh, you know Europe to the United States or Paris to the United States or Tokyo to London, for example, and the answer is absolutely yes. In addition to tracking user simulations from various locations, we can also include network information, things like ping and traceroute. So just very, because the question was asked, here in our dashboard, uh, we see, let me drill in here, we can see that from London I have a blinking red light. Okay, so this is, this is blinking because we set some type of alert trigger that said if we have a failure or if our performance is uh, below a certain threshold or above a certain threshold, depending on how you look at it, we want to trigger an alert. So we can drill into that and we can say, ah, our ping from, from that location is, is there's a problem. And we can drill in again. And in this case, let me just go back over the last... Uh, last seven days. We are looking at the history of that health check and we can actually see here, let me pick up, give me, bear with me one minute. So we are looking at our performance data where now again 
this, all, this test is all running on a local machine, so I have multiple VMs running, so my trace route is not terribly exciting. Uh, but <clears throat> we are capturing not only user simulation response from various locations, we're also capturing ping and trace route information. So in this case, we would go in and see that, okay, we were successful here, we see our response time for both the user simulation as well as the ping check, and we can actually go to the moment in time when it started failing. And we'd be able to see uh, the trace route leading up to that case. So we can see not only what the users are experiencing, but we can break it down in terms of how much of that time was spent just doing Hyperion stuff versus how much was spent doing network stuff. And if the problem is with the ping, then we immediately know that the problem is related to the network uh, and not Hyperion. If the prob if the ping was good, but our web form or report or workspace was taking too long to come up, then we know that we don't need to focus on the network, that we need to focus on the Hyperion infrastructure. So we can track anything from a high-level user simulation, which we're talking about today, to lower-level things like a network, ping, uh, URL probing, health checks from all of our remote locations. Okay. So we discussed the various test modes from ad hoc to defining a profile to replaying history down to running that interactive <clears throat> or rather iterative user simulation locally or from remote locations and all the types of things we can do with it. We can alert on it. We can see graphically over time how performance has changed. So there is tremendous value in incorporating user simulations at all those different, you know, at all those different levels. So now if I just come back to the presentation, just with the time that we have left, we talked about again what the tests mean, you really should, def you should decide what we're trying to get out of the test. These are the different types of tests that you can leverage to get your answers. Some other things that you should consider are things like your various load sites, meaning the different machines that you're going to run your load tests from, and whether it makes sense for them to be all within the data center or whether they should be geographically disperse. So one point is having geographically dispersed locations may, may, may skew stress testing, meaning we don't care whether consolidation is run from, uh, run from Tokyo or from New York. It doesn't, it doesn't change how long the consolidation runs, but it's very important for user simulations to know that how the quality of service at a remote location will be affected when there's 500 users on the system. So just considering where those test sites are, again, the concern, concurrency and ramp up, we talked about that as well. In terms of execution, once before the tests are run, you should determine what types of monitoring you want to have in place. So if you're using an external tool or doing it manually, obviously you want to track things, all the basics, things like CPU and memory, you also want to track some more detailed things like handles and threads. Um, with Exceltis, you have the capability of doing tracking things like S-based database statistics, as well as some detailed HFM counters, things like user count and memory per application. And then you execute the test. Again, if this is more of a load test, that kind of the big bang, then you'll probably be iterative where we detect failures in the load test and refine them and start determining where the failures are in the system. And if we detect that the problem is with a particular report, you may decide to change the mix of the reports that you're running because some reports are only going to be run every so often. And then repeat the test. So there's a, there's a strategy for once we go to execute the tests as well. And then analysis. I'm just going to cover a couple of screens. I didn't know if we'd have time to get to this, but uh, I, it looks like we'll have a quick bit of time. I just want to throw a little bit out there that when you get your results, depending on the tests you run, you know, it's important to be able to analyze your results, which is why if you're defining tests that, that don't represent what your users are actually doing, your results aren't going to be representative and therefore your analysis will be based on faulty information and really not worth a whole lot. But there's different things we want to look at. One is response by concurrency. So we, we 
established tests, we established a mix of tests that we were going to run at different concurrencies. And what we can see here are four different tests that we were running, and we can see how the response time changed by concurrency. And from this, we can start doing some predictive capacity planning, because I, from this, I can say, boy, I bet I could add a bunch of users running planning forms, and it's still going to degrade gracefully for some amount of time that I could add another 50 users running planning forms, and it'll likely be okay. Whereas financial reports and SmartView, they have already taken that turn, that if I add another 50 users, the performance is really going to be off the chart. So by being able to graph response by concurrency, we can start extrapolating what our performance will be as we add users. And this, this graph is something that's built into Exceltis. Another graph we do, which is a little more this is a little more, not uh, some more academic. We're looking at response distributions. So the blue line in this case represents report, re reports response distribution at 30 users. And what this means is that the average, if we were to say the average response time was around 11 or 12 seconds. Um, and then the, the distribution went down from anywhere from around five or six seconds to around 20 seconds. And what we've also done is we've plotted on this graph as well the standard distribution, which just kind of is it's more of a statistical thing. And what this does is this is relevant because this can give us an indication of what our users can what our users can expect. Or if this was a really tight curve, we could then go and say, wow, at 30 users, we can tell our users they can expect something that's going to be within this really small window. Where if this was really spread out, meaning it was really flat and it's going out to a couple standard deviations, what that tells us is that we cannot have any consistent expectation for our users, meaning they might get something that comes back in five seconds or might come back in 50 seconds, and it's really a toss-up as to what they're going to get. So the value of looking at distribution at each concurrency is just to get a feel for how to set expectations with users. So if they pick up the phone and say, wow, my report's taking 40 seconds, you can go back and say, well, you know what, that could be expected, and it could come back in 10 seconds or 40 seconds. Um, it's really not a problem until you hit you know, X seconds. So it's really, setting, it's really about setting expectations about what, what is consistent or what is inconsistent. Okay, I have two more, then I'll answer a couple questions, and then we're coming close to the end of our time. So this one, just really quickly, this is response over time for the same concurrency. And all this is really saying is that any concurrency in any system, there's going to be a certain amount of time before the system stabilizes. And it might be that the system is caching activity um, or there's other things going on such that, you know, over time we will hit some stable, some stable time where we can expect some, some consistent response time. But until we get there, we could get some wildly different results. So it's just looking at the response time over time Right off the bat, when we start our test, we might see a lot of inconsistent results, and then the system may settle down and we might get more consistent. That's all that this is saying. And then lastly, uh, it's really important to analyze all of our response time against metrics. So it's all fine that we can see how the response time for a report looks. We can see what our CPU is doing. and But by tracking it along with things like what our load is, we can start reconciling one with the other. So if we see that response time is really slow but our CPU is saturated, okay, we can start to understand that one is affecting the other. And then we see that the response time got better as our CPU um, you know, uh, got better and got more available, then that makes sense. So we can start saying, okay, our bottleneck is we are CPU bound or we are memory bound or we're bandwidth bound. Ultimately, we run all these tests to understand our system, but ultimately to improve it. So we have to be able to go in and reconcile where our bottlenecks are. So the only way to do that is by reconciling response time along with other KPIs, things like CPU, bandwidth, and things like that. Okay, so uh, let me just, there's a couple questions that were put in front of me. Okay, so the first question is how easy is it to define multiple users for tests like uh, financial reports? 
And the answer is uh, you, you saw me go in and add a, add a new report. It can be as easy as just double clicking on the user and putting a new username. If we want to add something like 50, uh, 50 users, then that's something we can actually open up the, the actual data file and enter in them manually. The idea is to try to make it as easy as possible to do right through our UI, uh, but ultimately if you have them in a list or in a text file, you can basically copy and paste them and add you know, any number of credentials that you wanted. And the answer is can you specify, or another question is can you specify unique POVs for each user? <coughs> Excuse me, and the answer is, is yes. For some of our tests, you define uh, what all of the, we have, we have gone in and we've recorded all of the key Hyperion tests, if you will, and we have factored out what the client specific information is, things like usernames, passwords, points of view, report names, and they can be pulled out to be defined as a global or as an iteration. So for any of those things, you can define your point of view for the smart view form. You can define the multiple point of views and have it randomly pick one during the run of the test. So basically, you can randomize the test to any level of detail you want, or you can fix certain things so that every test runs under a single user, but we're going to vary the report name or we keep the report name, but we vary the POV. So all of that is, is configurable. Okay. Again, so with that, I think we're just about out of time. Hopefully this was useful. The purpose of this webinar, again, was to talk about load generation as it applies to Oracle EPM with a focus on really breaking out what load generation means and show how taking that low generation that most people think of as this big bang do it once and breaking it down into many different levels can provide all types of different value. And we showed how it can be done via our tool. It can also be done you know, through other tools like Load Runner or done, man or, or done manually. But by doing implementing things at the different levels, you can get a lot of value and a lot of insight you know, uh, you know, out, of the, out of the system itself. So if there are any other questions that we didn't answer, we will get back to you directly. If there's any other uh, questions, please don't hesitate to contact Ed DeLisi or myself. Our contact information is here. And if you want a copy of this webinar, please uh, contact Ed DeLisi uh, directly, and he will see that, uh, that you get a copy of the, of the recording. So with that, thank you very much for your time. I will uh, disconnect, but I will leave this, this slide up in case you want to take down our contact information. Thanks, everyone, for joining.